Welcome to Just Some Guys Podcast. I'm Just Some Guy, and this is episode nine. Thank you for joining me once again. In this episode, we're going to break down Jonas Salk's book, Survival of the Wisest. Um, I'm going to do a two-part series. Part one is going to be the quick, quick breakdown, about 15 minutes of the centralized point. And part two will be the standard breakdown page by page, the overall uh, view. Uh, I chose this to do now because, well, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, they say. And all the world leaders are suggesting that we should probably have mandatory vaccinations. So what better time to read the book written by the man who's considered the father of modern inoculations. So strap in. This is going to be a very wild ride. And I hope you enjoy it. So what is Salk going to tell us in this book? What is it all about? And Why should we care? And before I answer that question, I'm going to read a little something from Willis Harmon, scientist. Quote, science and society exist in a dialectical relationship. The findings of science have a profound effect on society. None of us have any doubts about that. But science is also a product of society, very much shaped by the cultural milieu within which it developed. Western science has the form it does because it developed within a culture, placing unusual value on the ability to predict and control. Research on perception, hypnosis, repression, selective attention, mental imagery, sleep and dreams, memory, memory retrieval, etc. all suggest that the influence of the unconscious on how we experience ourselves and our environment may be far greater than is typically taken into account. So what is considered here is the fact that we do unconsciously carry our biases and our preconceived notions, our worldview, into our interpretations of what our scientific findings are. So with that said, to answer the question, why should we care what Salk has to say? Well, he is the father of modern vaccinations. He is the inventor of the polio vaccine. Uh, He created the Salk Institute that is now one of the largest in studying molecular biology, genetics, and neurosciences. And in his day, he also campaigned for mandatory vaccinations, much like Bill Gates does today. Therefore, I think we should be very uh, interested to hear what Jonas Salk has to say about the future and what mankind should be doing, and his overall worldview. And um, considering he is the one responsible for your kids getting somewhere near 60 vaccines. And so we begin with, evolution is the paradigm by which everything is interpreted. It is the dialectical process of all history. Man can learn wisdom from nature, and wisdom is the quality that will be selected in nature, in the evolutionary process. And of course, it is up to the scientific elite like Salk here to interpret or translate to you this wisdom from nature. And so we must allow science and nature to dictate our behavior and our values. And he believes we are transitioning from an epoch A to a new epoch, and that we need a complete inversion of all our values and morals, or else mankind will not survive. There is a crisis of overpopulation. This Malthusian notion that the world is overpopulated and that it will lead to our extinction. Therefore, man is the enemy of man, and man must regulate man or else nature will. So we need forced austerity and limits to growth, a la the Club of Rome fellows. Salt compares men to cancer on the earth. So again, we need a complete change and even inversion of our beliefs and morals and values in order to slow population growth and to evolve, to be selected in this new epoch. 
There is a battle of coexisting value systems currently, and one will win out. This is because man's values are just an evolutionary process of external factors. Evolution is a dialectical process, therefore cultural evolution is a dialectical process. Ergo, men should just change with the times. Now, these changes are inevitable, and they need to be, quote, guided. Guided by science and technology. Technology is progress. Progress is evolution. So those who resist progress are anti-evolutionary. And this group of anti-evolutionists, he says, may not survive if they do not go along with these changes. Again, Salk says we must look to the wise ones to guide us into what choices we need to make. So Salk will introduce us to his metaphysics, and he, by doing so, he will create an analogy or metaphor of the what he considers the being and the ego, which is similar to the genetic and somatic systems, which also relates to the DNA and the RNA. The genetic being contains the programming like DNA, and the somatic ego is the expression like RNA. Through this metaphor, he will make the case that altering the RNA, like a cancer or a virus, can have an advantageous effect, such as the virus responsible for the tulip colors. So yes, he's actually making a case for fucking with your DNA. He will say that since all man is, is random mutations of matter, that mutations can be introduced experimentally by a virus into an egg or a sperm cell. The genetic info of the virus would be incorporated in either DNA or RNA and transmitted. Then, of course, natural selection would determine if such changes should survive. Let me restate this. The guy who invented vaccinations suggests that all you are is a random mutation and that there's no difference between that and scientists introducing a virus into your body and that genetic info passing on through your children and your children's children and then just let natural selection, let nature decide if these mutations and changes should survive. He also says changing perceptions have a similar effect transmitting ideas from generation to generation by cultural means. New perceptions can be spread like a virus of the mind to alter favorably or unfavorably man's behavior. Again, favorability is a value judgment, one made by nature. Revolutionary ideas are the evolutionary equivalent to mutations. He says man's consciousness is expanding through science and believes scientism can give us the answers to man's nature and his relationship to the cosmos. This, of course, is a replacement for religion. Metaphors and analogies are to be used to express these ideas, since most of us are dummies. And so we need a common language and a common metaphysics, and also a common religion, which science will serve for this purpose. This will form an organism of mankind, and no longer a collection of individuals. He sees the revolutionary changes up through the 60s as evidence of continued growth and progress and evolution. And so he calls for us to disregard all of our past institutions and values to develop new ones that are more appropriate to today's changing circumstances. Now, where have I heard this before? This is literally liberalism, the dominant cultural milieu today. Salk will actually state that one of the goals of this book is to draw attention to the role value systems or worldviews play as regulatory factors guiding man. And one of these values we must develop is depopulation. We must restrict the freedom to have kids to protect other freedoms. This he considers a pro-life value or a pro-evolutionary value. He says that anything that doesn't agree with his ideas that lead to further evolution are anti-evolutionary, which must be rooted out and destroyed as enemies of the evolutionary process itself. He says choices will be made for factors favoring evolution versus those that don't. Those that don't will not survive. 
Now remember, it is his scientific elite class that will determine these factors, not you. So go along or do not survive. He says it won't be survival of the fittest, but survival of that which fits best. Thus, for mankind to evolve to survive, it requires judgment for continued existence that will have to be wise. Hence, survival of the wisest. By wisest, again, he means those who comprehend evolutionary process and can make the choices. Which, of course, is his scientific priest class. This is what he takes 50 pages to build up to that the elite should direct mankind's evolution, and they should choose our new worldviews. These new values should come from nature, translated by the scientific elite, of course, and not from our traditions, religion, culture, etc. We must liberate ourselves from restricting ethics, values, and morals to achieve our greater evolution, because those hold back the geniuses. But he says nature is relative, so we must be able to distinguish between wholesome and sick and learn from nature which is which. If man fails to act and judge wisely, nature will take an active hand in correcting his errors. Man needs to fulfill nature's role of selecting the fit and the wise. So man needs to regulate man and must act aggressively against those who do not value evolution. He says it is likely that the cost of human life of such changes will be considerable. And this brings us to the next major point Salk wants to make. That is, this implies the need for education and training. We must propagandize this worldview, teach kids to recognize those who don't agree. You can think of like Greta. Men must understand the causes, cures, and means for prevention of these that dissent. This is the correct view of the previously mentioned healthy versus sick. Choices must be made of which behavior is destructive. These value judgments are relative, as is evolution. They aren't objective or absolute. Objective universal claims are the basis for ethics, metaphysics, and values. These are anti-evolutionary. Remember what happens to those anti-evolutionary people. He says that absolutists are extremists, which is ironic to say the least. So we have to choose the wisest for positions of power and influence. Science will serve as the basis for what's right. And science will be the base for judgment for the masses. These wise men may be able to influence or direct human evolution, and he actually says some men have begun to make move towards this goal already. He predicts youth movements like Greta as they develop the necessary new educational systems and techniques to indoctrinate people. From birth to death, he will educate you. Metaphor and analogy will be used for the dumbed-down masses to communicate this scientism. He says we will use the arts to diffuse these ideas. You can think of things like science fiction movies and books. It will be necessary to create a homogeneous society to iron out all these differences, to get everyone to speak or think in this way. We need a scientific managerial class to run the society and the world. And there will be a hierarchy based on these talents and abilities. We need to develop new systems for identifying and dealing with those that are regarded as pathological, which is those that don't agree with them. And so again, we need this bureaucratic management of the unwise. There are interested groups, foundations, governments, NGOs, and the like that are all responsible for behavior modifications. We need to replace religion with scientism as a guiding moralistic factor. He is calling on you, the ignorant masses, to play your part, sacrifice, austerity, don't have kids, so that Jonas here and his scientific elite can pass on their superior genetics to save the human race. In the conclusion, he states that this was a future alternatives-based analysis. He touches on the idea that advances in technology modify men, as if it is part of the evolutionary process, and that this is a basis of the idea of controlling or directing man's evolution. 
And again, we need to alter our behavior due to new circumstances that which we create. He believes that we must intervene biologically to prevent what he calls de-evolution. And he states the same as SRI's report that we need to change men's image of himself, exposing him to the laws of nature, which will lead to new attitudes and behavior. Now, he doesn't mean actual laws of nature. He means the scientific, managerial, elite class corruption interpretation of the nature as to socially engineer the unwise masses. And that basically wraps up the quickest summation of Jonas Salk's book, Survival of the Wisest, that I can do. If you think all this is fantastical and crazy and you don't think he really says that, well then stick around and listen to part two where I go page and verse and break down all hundred and I think it was 26 pages of this book. And you can see with your own eyes, you can read along with me and see, is this really what he's saying? Thanks for watching and check out part two.